invite you to take a Bible with you this morning. Turn to the Gospel of Matthew, where we will be for some time uh, during this ordinary time. We find ourselves today in uh, chapter 10, a brief text, uh, verses 40 through 42. Um, the screen's going to pick it up at verse 40, but I would, I would love to back up just a couple of verses to verse 38. And so if you're able and with us this morning, if you're able to stand, I'd invite you to stand in honor of the Lord's word. I'm going to begin at verse 38. Those who don't pick up their crosses and follow me aren't worthy of me. And those who find their lives will lose them. And those who lose their lives because of me will find them. Those who receive you also receive... are. are those who receive you are also receiving me, and those who receive me are receiving the one who sent me. Those who receive a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Those who receive a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. I assure you that everybody who gives even a cup of cold water to these little ones because they are my disciples will certainly be rewarded. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So this morning, uh, we are at the end of what is oftentimes called uh, the, the mission discourse or the mission sermon of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, I talked to you about how uh, Matthew is trying to tell the story of Jesus through the lens of Abraham and David and the exile. But also scholars recognize that there are 10 major blocks of teaching. The first and most familiar to us is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. But this, chapter 10, is sort of the second piece of, of teaching that's all kind of compressed and compiled together. And so Jesus is sending them out and he's teaching them what discipleship slash apostleship is going to look like as they go into the world, proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand, proclaiming the new creation is there. And what is strange is that this sermon on, on going out actually ends with three verses, not for those who are going out, but the, for those who are receiving those who are going out. Three brief verses about how do we respond, how do we operate in hospitality uh, to those who are going out. And, and so this morning, in order to get at why these three verses are so significant, I have to tell you two stories from the Old Testament. All right, you ready? The first story is from Genesis 18 and 19. It's an odd story. Um, it's in the life of Abraham and Sarah. And if you remember Abraham and Sarah, you know that God has called them to leave their places of prote protection and provision to follow him. And here's the promise that's on their life. He's going to make them the father and mother of many nations. And through them, the whole world will be redeemed and blessed. The problem, of course, is by chapter 18, it has dawned on them that God has promised that they would be the father and mother of a nation so big that like the stars that you can't count, you cannot count their descendants. He's made that promise, but here's the problem, they can't have a baby. And so it's not off to a good start, this mission and call that has been placed on Abraham and Sarah's life. So in chapter 18, the strangest thing happens. Abraham is sitting outside his tent one day, and we are told that the Lord comes to visit him. And in the text, it's strange because the Lord actually comes seemingly in the form of a person with two other people. And in Hebrew and Greek, the word for angel and messenger is the same. And so we get this, what some translations call two messengers or two angels, but we get these three folks who come walking off in the distance and Abraham sees them. Now, here's the interesting thing to me about it. Abraham doesn't know that it's the Lord. The Lord didn't send him a note or give him a call, text him, hey, Abe, uh, keep your eyes open. We'll be in the neighborhood, you know, next week. He's just sitting outside his tent and he sees these three strangers wandering and he does an odd thing. He runs out to greet them and says, hey, strangers, come, come into my tent. Hey, Sarah, grab a goat. We're going to kill a goat. We're going to, well, we'll milk it first, and then we'll kill it. Uh, we're going to have milk, and we're going to eat, and I'm going to give you rest, and I'm going to give you protection, right? So he is practicing hospitality to these three strangers. It's hard for us to appreciate the importance of hospitality in most of human history. Um, I, as I keep talking about, I just finished this really big biography of George Washington, and there were several things that struck me as interesting. One of them was... I had forgotten or maybe didn't know that George Washington almost went broke several times in his life. 
Um, but, but one time when he really almost went broke, it was because after the Revolutionary War, he went back to Mount Vernon and people kept coming to his house. And he almost went broke because people would know where the Washingtons lived and they would come and knock on the door and he would say, oh, all right, come on in, Brent. You know, come on in, Petersons. Um, we got a room upstairs and, you know, Martha you know, kill a goat or whatever. Like, uh, like he would... He would put people up and they wanted to see the general, they wanted to eat dinner with him. In days where there was no Motel 6, right? No place to stay. People were vulnerable and in need. And so Abraham sees them, brings them into his tent, takes care of them. And here's what they do. Because of his hospitality, they bless him and say, we are giving you a blessing. And here's the blessing. In a year, Sarah will have a son. Now she cracks up at that and they say, well, why is she laughing? And she says, oh, I'm not laughing. He said, oh, yeah, you're laughing. And I would say, the text kind of says, you should laugh. This is a funny story, but also it's going to bring joy into your life. So they practice hospitality and they get a blessing. You with me? Chapter 19 is like the extreme opposite of that story. The text says the Lord remained with Abraham, but sent the two messengers on to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, when the two messengers head off to Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot, Abraham's nephew, is doing the same thing Abraham was doing, sitting outside, looking around. And when Lot sees these two strangers, he runs out and practices hospitality also. Says, hey, come hang out with me. Come into my home. I will take care of you. I will be a blessing to you. I will give you shelter. And they say, ah, no, that's all right. We'll just sleep here in the square. And he says, oh, no, this is a really bad neighborhood. You do not want to do that. Come into my home. I will take care of you. I will be care, you know, I will make sure that you are safe. But the story is is about the ways in which Sodom and Gomorrah turn on these strangers and turn on them in a way that is the exact opposite of welcome, but is actually a form of abuse of the stranger. They're literally going to misuse and abuse the stranger in their midst. Now, the reason why that is so important is because it sets, that story sets a context for Israel about how are they going to operate in the world. Because often Israel is going to be a stranger in strange lands, and there are going to be people who on a various scale will either have forms of hospitality and welcome into which then the land will be blessed, or they will enter into a strange land and people will say, oh, let's take their stuff, let's abuse them, let's misuse the stranger in our midst. And God says, when they do that, that nation will be cursed. And we will get to Matthew 25, which is the story of the sheep and the goats. You with me? So Jesus says, I'm sending you out, but let me give you a word, those of you who are going to receive them. If you welcome them, if you have your Bible still open, go back with me to verse 40. So I love the common English Bible, but I don't like how they translated this particular text. It's a little too common. Um, those who receive you will also, you are also receiving me, and those who receive me are receiving the one who sent me. There are eight receives in three verses in the common English Bible. And the only thing I don't like about it, and some of you who have other translations will notice, six of those eight words in other translations are the word welcome. So it reads this, those who welcome you are also welcoming me, and those who welcome me are welcoming the one who sent me. And those who welcome a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and those who welcome a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. So we can't understand this text without hospitality and the ways in which that's rewarded. The second story in the Old Testament is this, prophets are weird, prophets are super weird. Let me just remind you, some of you who may not know, but some of you who have forgotten, let me remind you of how weird the prophets are. Isaiah, one of the most important prophets, spent a pretty long portion of his life walking around naked, um, which thank you for not doing that today, right? Like that, th that's kind of odd. Um, Jeremiah buried his underpants, right? Wore a yoke around town and did a whole bunch of other just super odd kind of prophetic things. Hosea married a prostitute, and then when they had a child, they named that daughter unloved, which just had to be so hard on the first day of school every year, right? Is unloved here anywhere? Unloved? Bueller, Bueller. Um, Ezekiel ate the scroll, was struck mute for a time, ate barley cakes baked over cow manure, 
used a sword to shave off his beard and then split the beard in three, burnt a third of it, kind of scattered a third of it around town, stuck it in various places, and then threw a third of it into the wind to just blow away. And when he wasn't doing weird stuff, he was out in the desert preaching to bones. Like, like these are really odd. Prophets are strange people. And so the question becomes, if you go back to the text, verse 41 says, those who receive a prophet or welcome a prophet as a prophet are those who welcome a righteous person as a righteous person. So what's so unique about the text is this. It is saying not just, hey, it would be great if you were hospitable to outsiders, which would be great. But the text is, these people that are being sent out into the world are going to be weird. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. They're going to be odd. Because as odd as the prophets were, what made them even stranger is they were convinced that the strangeness that they participated in was commanded by God. And so now he's inviting us to invite the prophet in knowing full well that they're a prophet. Come in, Isaiah, we have some clothes for you, right? Come in, Jeremiah, um, we, no, we're, we're fine. We don't need your barley cakes, right? Like, come on in. So we are receiving them as prophet. Now, the reason I wanted us to back up a couple of verses is because the apostles that Jesus is sending out are called to take up their cross. And I want to clarify this because at times I think I'm misunderstood. The call to take up the cross is a really odd call. So sometimes I am fearful that what is heard when we talk about the cross is this, that we are inviting people to be passive towards evil in the world. So that to take up the cross is to be a person, for example, who doesn't care about social stuff in the world, doesn't care about inequity, doesn't care about the abuse and brokenness of our world. We're just here to do spiritual stuff, right? Love. And so at times what happens then is when we talk about the cross, especially for those who have been misused, to say to take up the cross means what you're supposed to do then is just continue to take the abuse that has been part of your life. Brent really helped me in conversation this week about this. Um, there's a moment in the gospel of Mark, uh, remember Jesus heals two blind men um, at both ends of this very important section of Mark. As Jesus heads to Jerusalem, blind Bartimaeus calls out to him, have mercy on me. And Jesus heals Bartimaeus of his blindness. And then the strangest thing happens. Bartimaeus joins him immediately on the journey to Jerusalem, ostensibly to go to death, to go to take up the cross. And so what's crazy, if you're still with me, what's crazy about this is Bartimaeus gets healed so he can die. But what's important about that is this, you can't, as Brent helped me this week, you can't give up your life until you have one. But this, and please listen to me. You, are you looking at me? Are you looking at me? <laughs> the cross is not a call to roll over in the face of evil. In fact, if you look back in the text, Jesus says, what we're whispering right now, you're gonna go shout. And if you think I've come to bring peace and passivity to the world, I've come to bring things that will feel like division because the cross is a call to stand up against abuse and misuse and violence and all of that ugliness. But here's the trick. It is a call to stand up against that without becoming it. And that's what is so challenging. It's not hard to compete against violence with violence. It's not, a, it's not hard to meet abusers with abuse. That's not hard. The challenge of the cross is to stand up against that. Jesus was not crucified on accident. And that is the call. Um, if we had more time this morning, we'd go through the whole Sermon on the Mount as we've done in the past. When Jesus has turned the other cheek, he's calling us to, when someone slaps you as a form of disrespect, turn the left cheek as well, because now they're gonna have to punch you but here's what's gonna happen. You're going to expose that person who thinks they are above you as somebody who is actually evil. 
And when someone wants to sue you and take your cloak, give them everything. Stand there with Isaiah and buck naked. Why? Because you'll be exposing a system that says, oh, we're just taking this. We know it's your livelihood and you have no future. But now it exposes the system as unjust. When the Roman soldier wants to go one mile, which they can go two, which now makes them a lawbreaker, to expose the injustice of the system, but in a way that keeps your dignity and keeps you from becoming that which you are standing up against. Oh, this is good. You with me? So here's the thing. Jesus is sending these oddballs into the world. And here's the question. Are you going to join the revolution? Or are you going to slam the door against it? Please, I, this is not a text about people coming to your door with tracks. And are you going to have cookies with them? This is about the social revolutionaries of Christ taking up their cross in the world. And the question is, are you going to slam the door on that? Are you going to join the revolution? Or at the very least, could you aid and abet the new creation? Could you give it shelter? Could you at least support it? Could you at least give it water? So, um, as I've shared with you a couple weeks, I'm getting ready for teaching... Um, history and polity of the church of Nazarene in the fall. And I'm making my way through the massive sort of centennial history. And uh, it's reminded me in some good ways about how revolutionary our, uh, our kind of ancestors in this tradition were. Uh, so let me talk just about a few of their revolutionary tendencies. So we were really birthed because at the turn of the 20th century, there were folks who were convinced that an awful lot of Christianity in America in particular had become what I would call kind of cultural Christianity. People believed they were Christian because they were American. And they had they'd come to believe that America was kind of a Christianized nation. So if you're a good citizen, you must be a Christian. And they lived out kind of forms of really kind of rationalistic cultural Christianity. And like our ancestor in theology, John Wesley, during his time in England, felt like that is not faith at all. Like that is not, this is not inviting us to cultural forms of Christianity. This is inviting us to the radicalness of sanctified holiness, right? And so this, the, the life of Christ is about being filled with the spirit. It's being transformed every part of our existence belonging to Christ. And so, so we were birthed because there were folks who said, yes, that is the call. The call is to holiness. And they would have tent meetings and revivals and prayer meetings, and they would just invite people into this life of holiness. Now, our founders, we often say, say we didn't break off from anybody, although a lot of our founders were Methodists. We had people who were Quakers and Baptists and Congregationalists and Presbyterians and non-denominationalists. We had like all of these scattered folks who were themselves kind of radicals preaching this holiness. And I want to say to you, when you study them, did some of them go overboard? Yes, they were so weird. Yes. They jumped pews, they ran aisles, they waved hankies. Did some of them go crazy with legalism? Yes. Like were some of them, did they go a little too far at times in their revolution? Absolutely. Was the door shut on their face? Yes. In many ways, we were formed because people get, kept getting kicked out of the places where they were called home. But at their best, they were calling us to something that's right, that, that resonates with the new creation. And some joined the revolution, and thanks be to God, some who at least couldn't become revolutionaries opened the door and gave space and care and support and a cup of cold water. And Jesus says the reward that is waiting for the revolutionaries awaits those who, who invited them in. At the turn of the century, when those holiness revolutionaries were raised up, the industrial revolutionary, the industrial revolution was at its pinnacle. There was this massive separation between the rich and the poor. Even people who were starting to merge in the middle class were largely given to 
jobs that were monotonous and meaningless and separated them from their, the product of their work. The church realized this and felt like many of those churches that had settled for cultural Christianity also became comfortable places for rich Christians. That never raised any questions about whether their wealth was contaminating them and taking them apart from the gospel. And so our revolutionary foremothers and forefathers said, listen, there will always be a seat in the front for the poor in the church of the Nazarene. In fact, we'll call ourselves, we'll give ourselves a name that associates ourselves with people. Nobody thinks anything good could come from them. And I know that we've had policies against alcohol and that kind of stuff, but all of that came out of this idea that the people who are being misused and broken by substance abuse were the poor. Their lives were purposeless and meaningless, and they were going to those substances to find some kind of life. And instead, we're finding death. And it's why we were committed to education. Because we felt like only the rich were getting educated, so we started schools in strange places like Nampa, Idaho. So that the poor could receive an education. Did that go, did some of them go to excess? Yes. Did the door get slammed in their faces? Yes. Did some in strange places like Nampa, Idaho join the revolution? Yes. But thanks be to God, there are at least a few also who opened the door and gave shelter and support and cups of cold water to those who are convinced that in the new creation, there cannot be a dividing line between the rich and the poor. The church came up in a time when the social conversation had to do with the rights of women. Women's suffrage was an important conversation. The church was committed to eradicating the brokenness of generations of misuse of women in rugged forms of patriarchy. The objectification of women in society the economic marginalization of women. And so they joined the revolution <laughs> and, some, and we joined that by saying, listen, this church will be committed to the ordination of women. We will not have a boundary between men and women in, in ministry. And not only will we not have a boundary there, we, a lot of our schools started because we started homes for women who had been abused, for people who had, left lives as sex workers and now were pregnant and needed somebody to care for them and their child. Did some in that movement maybe go too far? Maybe. Did they get the door slammed on their face? Yes. Folks left the church over it. Folks wouldn't join because of it. Folks still today leave over it. But did some pick up the revolution of a new creation that says there is now no longer male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus, yes. And thankfully, there were some who maybe couldn't quite join the revolution, but they opened the door and gave support and care and nurture to the revolutionaries of the new creation. The issues of race were very much alive. The Civil War had only happened a couple of decades before Church in 1908, when we got together at Pilot Point, this was a really tough issue. North and South Christians trying to unite. I don't wanna pick on any of our sister denominations, but there are some of our friends in faith who still have North and South in their names because they couldn't work out this difference. We were gonna work this out. Now, the way we picked up that revolutionary, that revolution that there is now no longer Jew nor Greek, there, this, those boundaries between ethnicities and cultures have been brought down, was we were gonna be an international church and we still are. We're one of the only denominations that said, we are gonna keep it together. <laughs> Some of you who are unfamiliar with us, we have six leaders, we call them general superintendents. I am convinced our founders would be so delighted if we could resurrect them and they could see that three of the six of our, of our global church leaders are non-white North Americans. 
In fact, the regional leader of our district right now is somebody who was raised in the Cape Verde Islands. Our founders would love that because they would see it as a sign of this revolution that is taking place. Now, I will confess, did we get it all right? No. In fact, we've largely failed in North America. And even the conversations recently are ways of having to wrestle with the fact that for generations, we haven't done all that we could have in North America to be participate in that new creation. And can those revolutions go too far? Yes. And can they move us in ways that are not what it means to carry the cross? Yes. Can doors get slammed in your face? Yes. Will some join that revolution? Yes. Uh, I will just say, my children have joined that revolution. And if the church doesn't get it right, they will find somebody who, is, who has joined that revolution. But at the very least, could we open the door and encourage and pray and give support to and a cup of cold water to those who are working to bring about a revolution of a new creation in those ways in the world? So I got an email this morning and I don't really have permission to share it, but I won't tell you who sent it to me. I think it'll be okay. I woke up early this morning and I opened my email and I got this email and I'm sharing with, it with you because it's really typical of, what, of the kinds of things I've received probably two or three of a week for the last several months. It just says this, Dr. Daniels, I don't believe we've met in person, but I've followed and read from afar. I'm reaching out to see if you would be willing to spend a few minutes on the phone with me sometime in the near future. I very much admire how you've navigated politics, culture, church, and am at a bit of a personal crossroads in light of the compounded issues of COVID, as well as what I believe is a much needed emergence of racial dialogue and change. I seem to be finding myself being placed into a category of being divisive if I don't take a less quote unquote liberal stand. In 22 years of pastoral ministry, I've never been particularly outspoken, nor have I handled myself poorly with social media, public commentary, etc. However, after 12 years of refocusing this church into what I believed was a healthy external focused body, I'm realizing I'm on one end of an unfortunate spectrum from a number of influential people in the church. Long story short, I guess I'm wondering if you would be willing to lend an ear. I've been getting about three of those a week. The cross is not an invitation to just lay down and hope God works it all out. The cross is the willingness of the revolutionaries of a new creation to go into the world, to call out all of its brokenness without becoming a reflection of that which is breaking the creation. And can those moments at times push us beyond what it means to take the cross? Yes, and we need God's help to discern that. And can the door be shut in your face? Yes, and if I'm not here next week, uh, you know, whatever. Will some join the revolution? By God's grace, I certainly hope so. But at the very least, could we be hospitable to the wacky prophets of a new creation and invite them in just not because we're nice people, but invite them in as prophets and as the righteous <laughs> and give shelter and care and a cup of cold water so that God's new creation can continue to break forward. God help us um, in these days. They're not unlike um, generations of 
now followers of you who have found moments and times when the prophetic imagination breaks out. Give us wisdom um, to discern how rightly to live the life of the wacky prophet without, without losing the call to take up the cross. And have mercy on us for the ways that we have shut the door at times on the inbreaking of your new creation. I pray that you would raise up disciples, apostles, willing to take up their cross, knowing full well how Isaiah was treated and Jeremiah was treated and Hosea was treated and Ezekiel was treated and you were treated. who believe too deeply in the power of your spirit and in the hope of a new creation to give up. So raise up the revolutionaries of the new creation. And for those who cannot embrace that call, at least help them to open the door. To be hospitable to be encouragers, to be the resourcers of those that you've called and sent. And for all that you will do to God, be the glory. Great things you are doing and great things you have done and great things you will do. May we not miss out. So you are welcome here. Bring your blessing upon this place. Bring your blessing on us. For we pray this in Jesus' name.